Are you being live streamed? Yes, we know. Excellent. All right. This module covers two chapters today. Again, we're making our way towards the end. We're in the second half, and we only have four lectures in the second half, leaving the rest of the weeks to practice for the Security Plus exam. And I will remind you that if you are able to pass the Security Plus exam, you get an automatic A in the course. You are able, you are eligible as Cabrillo College students to get a voucher for 49% off of the exam. The link is in the homepage of uh, um, the class in Canvas. If you can't find it, just let me know. Um, yeah, if you are able to sign up, take and pass the Security Plus exam before the semester is over, you will get an automatic A because you achieved the whole goal of the class. That does mean you don't have to submit any assignment, any tests and anything because you got the thing. The only number you have to, the, the, there is no like, um, you have to get this score or higher for me to give you an automatic A, as long as CompTIA says you pass because when you take the test, you instantly get a result. And it's usually, if you get more than 700 points, you get the, you get the, uh, the paper that says you passed. That's all I need. I don't care if you scored 701. As long as you passed, you passed, you got the certification. Then you don't have to submit any work. You send, you send me that proof, the uh, a picture or, um, a scanned copy of the uh, the um, the document you got from CompTIA or from Pearson, and you're done. You're done with the course. So with that, let's continue into chapter eleven and twelve. Chapter eleven is about protecting the endpoints, because that's where a lot of attacks come from. As security professionals, you'll be asked to recommend, implement, manage, or assess security solutions intended to protect desktops, mobile devices, servers, and a variety of systems referred to as endpoints. You need to know what options exist, what, uh, where, and how they are commonly deployed, and what considerations you need to take into account. Um, preserving boot integrity would be your first place. UEFI leverages secure boot where it only boots anything that is trusted. It takes a hash of the firmware, the bootloader, drivers, and anything else part of the process against what's in the trusted platform module uh, to be validated and lets the computer know, yes, we can boot this, or maybe no, we shouldn't. TPM chips provide a hardware root of trust, as well as holding serial numbers that can't be modified or cloned. This prevents any odd operating system from running on that system. Here's your little TPM chip. Antivirus or anti-malware, never discount. Antivirus, anti-malware, it is a defensive layer and one of the most common. Uh, it's signature based, so it's reactive. It only knows what to do when it has an identity for it. it they do come with heuristic or behavioral based where they look at actions and kind of determine, is this a problem, is this not? The newer ones have AI and machine learning and sandboxing as well. There are the allow and deny lists. These allow or prevent software from being installed, 
ran, removed, or disabled on systems. These are hard to implement because there's a lot of applications and end users like to use a lot of applications. So it, it really becomes a game of whack-a-mole that slows you down. Endpoint detection and response. These tools, monitoring capabilities allow search and exploration of the collected data for use by investigators to detect uh, suspicious data. They search for any indicators of compromise using automated tools and detection engines. Data loss prevention is a way of tagging data so that whenever data is, that specific data is copied, is put into an email, is put into a USB drive, you get notified and or it prevents that data from getting copied and, and transferred out. There's also network defenses using tools like host intrusion detection systems and prevention systems to listen in what's happening on the network to take action as needed. Uh, can't always or can't forget to mention hardening the endpoint themselves. Most systems do have ways of shutting down unnecessary services, of preventing certain programs from running, use all those things. The basic mindset is if you don't need it, turn it off. Very plain, very simple. And speaking of services, here are a few that are common or uncommonly used. For example, there really should be no reason why remote desktop is used in either Windows or Linux. If you absolutely need it, then put it behind a firewall, put it behind a VPN, find a way to secure it because RDP is horribly insecure. Speaking of, Harding operating systems. There is a CIS benchmark that I linked in the lecture notes that you can use. Um, everybody says these things. So this is nothing new, like setting password history to remember 24 or more passwords, setting password age to 60 or fewer days, setting the minimum length to 14 or more characters, disabling the, uh, the storage of reversible encryption, of control alt delete, of uh, the system blocks as soon as you close the lid. The problem with all that is it's not being done. It's constantly reminded. It's constantly said at conferences, at talks, at lectures, because people still don't do it. And these are the basic things we've been saying for like 20 years. Irregardless of the operating system, you need to know that operating system hardening uses system settings to reduce the attack surface. The tools and standards exist to help with that process in assessing, auditing, and maintaining OS hardening for your organization. That's all part of the overall strategy. Windows registry is still in existence in Windows and it is the underbelly for Windows. You have to harden this to prevent allowing for things like remote registry, limiting access, because as soon as an attacker or tool is able to get to the registry, they can make any changes and cause much harm to Windows. Uh, naming standards helps with management and incident response, helps you to quickly identify what system we're talking about in an issue and overall system admin. Patch management, you should be installing patches. Now I don't mean install patches the moment they come out, always test them. Always make sure that they're not gonna break something in your infrastructure. 
and then go ahead and apply the patch. But still patch. Use full disk encryption wherever possible. It is not that hard to implement full disk encryption because it is a real possibility that somebody's walking around with a laptop and it gets stolen. And the last thing you want is your PII or your intellectual property being taken with it. If in case or when that happens, you can just simply keep the thing encrypted and they can't get to it. The best thing they can do is reformat it. That's fine. Your data is still saved because they weren't able to access it. When you get rid of a drive or any media that has had intellectual property or, or PII, make sure that it's properly sanitized. You don't want somebody running a tool like uh, Autopsy, which is free and open source, and pulling up files that you thought you were deleted, but they're still around. Or you could just simply destroy it by shredding, pulverizing, incinerating. That can always be fun. Plenty of tools exist in any operating system that allow manipulation of files. I mean, that's kind of what you need to do, right? You need to edit a file to update it, to do whatever. You don't want the wrong people making edits. So having the proper permissions for files and ensuring that permissions are set is also important. Security Plus expects you to understand how to use PowerShell and Bash effectively. The exam also expects you to know how to use OpenSSL to identify whether a secure communication is necessary but absent or when OpenSSL is misconfigured. When it comes to embedded systems, these computers are built into other devices like industrial machinery, appliances, cars. They're highly specialized, running customized OS with specific functions and interfaces. They may also have things like Wi Fi, cellular, or other networking means. They could also run things like real time operating systems which process data as it comes in rather than using interrupts. They respond quickly to input and have little variance to their input. Security Plus mentions three embedded systems, the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, and the Field Programmable Gate Array. So Raspberry Pi, if you've never seen it, is this credit card sized computer that can run a variety of OSs and has capability to scale. The Arduino is a microcontroller with a low power CPU, but has interfaces for sensors and motors. It does not have any wired or wireless networking capability. And the field programmable gate array is a computer chip that can be redesigned to perform specific tasks and can be a component of an embedded system. Assessing any embedded system is the same as any traditional computer, like identifying their manufacturer, the interfaces with the world, their network connections, how to update, find, uh, document their findings, patch management, and all and everything else. Industrial control systems, or ICS, is a broad term for industrial automation. The supervisory control and data acquisition, or SCADA, refers to large systems that run power and water distribution or other systems that cover large areas. SCADA copies data acquisition and control devices, computers, communication capabilities, and an interface to control and monitor the architecture. They're usually found running complex manufacturing and industrial processes while, where monitoring Adjusting and controlling the entire process is critical to success. 
ICS and SCADA can be used to control, uh, to use, blah, 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 use to control and manage facilities like HVAC systems. They provide a complex issue for security pro professionals like yourselves uh, because they're mostly designed without security in mind. Whatever solution you use, it has to figure out how will it work with that real-time operating system and all the other moving parts without slowing anything down. Internet of Things is a broad term for a network connected device that uses automation, sensor security and similar tasks. IoT devices bring issues like poor security practices, like weak default credentials, the lack of network security, exposed or vulnerable services, lack of encryption, weak authentication, embedded credentials, insecure data storage. Uh, they have short lifespans and there's a variety of vendor data handling practice issues. IoT is not straightforward. And there are also specialized systems that you have to consider like medical systems that are network connected or have embedded systems with Bluetooth capabilities and they are outdated, no longer supported. The company who made them no longer exists. There's smart meters that track a utility usage via wireless, providing a attack surface that, that can be interfered with. Vehicles, drones, and any autonomous vehicles have their own vulnerabilities that could turn that device into a lethal weapon. VoIP systems sometimes have an interface for direct uh, remote login or management. Printers, believe it or not, can always be a source of an attack because they have very poor security. And surveillance systems as well, especially those that are connected to the internet. On top of all that, you also have to think about how things are connected. There are a lot of devices who use cellular connectivity, which means there's another way that people can get in. There's also protocols like the Zigbee, that's a low power peer-to-peer -peer communication that also doesn't have a security model, but is used heavily for home automation and similar uses. And uh, still the best way to attack anybody is through the home. Now, thanks to the pandemic, they're connected to their work. So if you can get into the home, you can get into work. So the constraints that you have with embedded systems are things like their computational power and capacity. Systems may not have the means to do cryptographic processes, to run firewalls, anti-malware, and do its intended purpose. Some may not connect to a network due to the, to the way it's built. So things like patching, monitoring, maintenance becomes difficult. Uh, with no real or no standard network connectivity, CPU or memory, there's no real way to authenticate. So it's harder to say only authorized users can use this device because it allows anybody. And with embedded systems, there's a really high cost to change, which is why places like hospitals still use outdated uh, software like Windows XP on their MRI scanners because it's not cheap to replace. But we need them. Questions on chapter 11. I see a nope. I see two nopes. If this is exploding kittens, we'd be noping a nope with a nope. 
Well then, let's move on to chapter 12. Um, yeah. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da Give me one sec to send an invite Zoom link. And then we will move forward. Open up my Gmail. There you go. Cool. Man, we're halfway through. Chapter number 12 is about designing secure networks. As security professionals, you must understand and be able to implement design and uh, implement design and architectures found in networks and properly secure them. You need to know what tools and systems are deployed, why they're deployed, and how they can be deployed as part of a layered security design. The concept of defense in depth applies. Multiple controls ensure that a failure in a single or multiple controls is unlikely to cause a security breach. Being able to conceptually describe the network and the various answers to secure the layers is expected at this level. This picture is good to remember. Because like I said, in interviews, you do get the kind of question of, can you tell me how to secure every layer of the OSI model? Being able to answer that is a really good thing. Network segmentation. Networks can be divided into logical or physical groupings based on trust boundaries, functional requirements, or other reasons to apply controls or assist with functionality. We have things like VLANs that segment at the data link layer. We have DMZs that contain systems exposed to less trusted areas. We have intranets and extranets, internal networks and external networks that are uh, provided to partners or customers. There is the zero trust where no one is trusted. There's network access control, determines whether a system is allowed to connect to a network, check their patch level, security settings, and so on. And there's also uh, port scanning and port mirroring, where we copy the traffic that's coming from one uh, device to another. There's port security and port level protections. We can limit the number of MAC addresses that can be used on a single port, prevent MAC address spoofing, have content addressable memory table overflows, and plugging network devices to extend the network. Spoofing a MAC address is relatively easy and it should not be a stopgap measure. But doing things like preventing loops from happening on the network, preventing broadcast storms, preventing a spanning tree protocol packets from going out certain interfaces, preventing any DHCP snooping are just simple ways that can be applied to net to smart uh, switches to prevent any rogue device from trying to take over the network, like becoming a DHCP server or DNS server, or trying to expand the network without our authorization. There's also VPNs. A VPN will link endpoints together and act as though they are on the same network. A VPN is not required to have encryption. 
in its basic form, it's just making a tunnel. It doesn't have to be encrypted. So you do want to, if you're using a VPN, you do want to double check that it is actually encrypting. The two main types that you'll see in Security Plus are the IPsec VPN, which is using layer three, requires a client to operate in a tunnel where entire packets are sent to the other end. There's also the transport mode where the IP header isn't protected, but the payload is. IPsec is used for site-to-site -site VPNs and any need to transport more than just web application traffic. SSL VPN, which is using TLS, is used as a portal-based approach where users access it through a web page and then access services through that connection. These are clientless on the endpoint and allow segmentation using different hosts or names. When it comes to appliances, there are jump boxes. These are secured and monitored systems that provide access into security zones with different security levels. You use things like RDP or SSH or VNC to get to that box. And it's through that box that you can then access a secured network. So rather than having the endpoint connect directly to the secured network, we're connecting to another system who can who will be in the middle. There are load balancers. They distribute traffic to multiple systems, provide redundancy, and allow for ease of upgrades and patching. There are different kinds like the active active who distributes load among multiple systems that are online in use at the same time. There's the active passive, which brings any backup or secondary system when an active system is removed or fails to respond. They have different ways of doing either or, and that's the round robin where each request is sent to servers by working through a list. There's the least connection where traffic to the server with the least number of active connections. There's the agent-based adaptive that monitors load and other factors that impact a service response time. And IP and source IP hashing. It hashes the source IP to assign traffic to servers and is the most random. Other things that are added into that are like the weighted least, the least connection algorithm combined with predetermined weight for each server. There is fixed weight, a pre-assigned weight for each server based on their capability or their capacity. Weighted response, combined server response time with weight value assigned, and persistence. Client and server continue to communicate throughout the session for a smoother experience with consistent information maintained about the client. All these terms do show up in Security Plus. Do you need to know all the math behind those? Absolutely not. But you need to know the difference between round robin, least connection, agent-based adaptive, and source IP hashing. Proxy servers accept and forward requests, centralizing the request and allowing actions to be taken on the request and responses. They can filter or modify traffic and cache data and use to support access restrictions by IP address or similar requirements. Forward proxies are placed between clients and servers. They conceal the original content and can anonymize traffic or provide access to resources that might be blocked by an IP address or a geographic location. A reverse proxy is placed between a server and a client used for load balancing and caching content. Clients can query a single system, but have traffic load spread to multiple systems or sites. So forward and a proxy, a forward and reverse proxy are not the same. A forward proxy helps uh, clients. A reverse proxy helps the server.
So a forward proxy would be, I'm trying to get to Google and it's being blocked by a school. So I'm gonna use a forward proxy to make the request on my behalf. So that it doesn't look like it's coming from me. Then I can get access to whatever I'm trying to get to. A reverse proxy is a number of servers are ready to respond and we can load balance those multiple servers to respond from one source. Network address translation gateways allows many private IP addresses to be used as a single public IP to access the internet. This is all V4, V6 doesn't have this problem. NAT gateways provide the function and track which packets should be sent to each device. These gateways are used in home and cloud infrastructure as a service environment where private addresses are used for internal networking. We have content and URL filters. The content filter based on rules like blocking URLs, domains or host patterns, IP reputation and so on. It has the same problem with um, being very, with whitelisting and blacklisting applications of you're gonna have a, a lot of back and forth fighting to stay up to date, up to par with uh, whatever's being blocked. Some of the newer ones are, um, have things like machine learning and AI who can figure it out. Like I mentioned, data loss prevention will prevent any data that's tagged from accidentally or intentionally being leaked. Intrusion detection and prevention systems will detect threats and block them if it's a prevention system. Though they have signature-based and heuristic-based uh, ways of looking at activities, they, the prevention systems will react and stop anything that they think is a problem. Firewalls, there are two main types covered in Security Plus, the stateless and stateful. The stateless are packet filters. They are the, the stateless are the most basic type. Stateful firewalls are dynamic. They make decisions on the conversation instead of just the source destination IP port protocol. Wonderful firewalls. And there's also the unified threat management. This is basically a combination of everything I just mentioned all together in one. They're deployed at network boundaries. They could replace several security devices while providing a single interface to manage and monitor. So they can have firewall capabilities, content filtering, anti-malware, IDS IPS, VPNs, and so on. They're pretty neat. They're usually expensive, but they do the job. When it comes to network security, uh, there are different ways to get into a network. If you have a device that's connected to your network that also has a cellular connection, that's an out of band management. This is great for dealing with like remote situations where if one, if the main way goes down, there's another way in. to troubleshoot, to reset, to whatever. It's also another point of possible attack that you have to keep in mind. Access control is still come back over and over again because we haven't gotten rid of them. They're still useful. Quality of service is another way to manage networks. 
using uh, the IEEE's 802.1Q to define how traffic is tagged and prioritized. An improperly configured quality of service can be a threat to networks that can overrun them. Route security continues to be a problem for large businesses because things like BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, doesn't have security built in. The Open Shortest Path First, OSPF, does integrate security, but it's not enabled by default. And the Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol is a Cisco proprietary protocol. And let's be real, not every business has Cisco equipment. So if you are really well-versed in EIGRP and you walk into say a Palo Alto network or you walk into a Fortinet network or a Juniper, you're not gonna have EIGRP. DNS, domain name system by itself is not a secure protocol. We came up with the domain name system security extension to provide some authentication for DNS data. If an attacker is able to get into a DNS server, they can do all kinds of malicious madness of redirecting an entire uh, infrastructure down the wrong path. Having things like DNS sinkholes are configured to provide incorrect answers to specific queries to cause um, malicious or unwanted domains to resolve to a harmless address and allow logging uh, to identify any infected or compromised systems. There are, uh, there's a number of open source DNS sinkhole projects that you can add into your home network that lets you know when a device is compromised and is trying to get into one of these malicious addresses. Having things like monitoring service and systems to tell you when a port has opened and is responding, doing uh, metrics is also another great way of looking at the overall network. Creating fingerprints for files. So when certain files are adjusted or are art, all, art, ugh, altered, is again important because you don't want certain files with intellectual property to be altered uh, by just anybody. Having tools like honeypots and honey files where you, you have fake information, but as soon as it's accessed, as soon as it's copied, as soon as there's interaction with it, a, an alert is raised, lets you know, hey, somebody is poking around where they shouldn't that you can then take steps in your monitoring to see who it is, where it's coming from, and get more information to find out if this is an outside threat, an inside threat, you know, get, get together all the information you need by providing that fake info that is tempting. There are secure protocol options to the insecure protocols that we use daily. The problem always becomes actually using it. Because as I said, if you implement security, you lose convenience and you have to work around that, that reality that people are gonna complain, people are gonna be unhappy, but you have to deal with it. You gotta help them out to understand and, and utilize the more secure protocols. These do show up on the Security Plus exam. On path attacks or man in the middle is a common used term. It's an attacker that causes all traffic that should be sent to an intended recipient 
to be relayed through a device that the attacker controls. They're able to eavesdrop or even alter the communication. You could use things like SSL stripping and man in the browser where the attacker gains access to the communication and is able to see what is happening. So uh, preventing HTTP strict transport security uh, in order to prevent any protocol downgrade, cookie jacking is important for browsers not installing uh, any um, add-ons or plugins that aren't trusted are just two easy ways that you can you can prevent yourself from getting hit by man in the browser or man in the middle. With DNS, I mentioned that is a very secure, not a very secure, a very essential protocol to our networks. If DNS isn't working, then everybody complains the internet is down. We have DNS hijacking, changing the registration of a domain through either a vulnerability, social engineering, or a legitimate owner not renewing the domain. There's DNS poisoning caused by man in the middle where an attacker provides a DNS response prevent, pretending to be an authoritative DNS server. A, uh, an actual DNS server will see that and cache it. And now that that poison has a longer term effect because everybody else who asks for that site or that resource will get the, the poison to response. In layer two, we have the address resolution protocol poisoning. The same thing as DNS, just for IPv4 at layer two. So we flood the MAC address tables of local devices with false information. There's MAC cloning, where we duplicate MAC addresses of a device to bypass any MAC filtering. But again, uh, MAC filtering shouldn't really be used because it's very easy to spoof. There's also the distributed denial of service attacks. These are large scale botnets uh, that use a, a very large amount of volume to uh, bring down a surface. And it's not really bring down as in it shuts it down. It's just so overwhelmed that it can't respond to legitimate requests. Uh, these tools that I provided for you are some of the tools that you need to be familiar with for the test. They will ask you about uh, what, for example, what argument will do, uh, will show you the, the current IP address in Netstat. They'll ask you how, um, they'll give you some examples of NS lookup and ask you which is the correct one to do a, a domain lookup. So being well-versed in how the tool works, what its arguments are, will help you along uh, in that test. Also, tools like Nmap, Nessus, and OpenVAS show up as tools that you, again, should be familiar with because they'll ask you about port scanning. They'll ask you a, a little bit about vulnerability management. They'll ask you uh, OpenVAS is showing us this, what do you think? Or what? Um, how does this relate to the scenario that they throw at you? You will see Netcat. You will see curl. Again, general tools that are out there that are easily accessible, that try hackney rooms exist where you can practice using them. Uh, 
the harvester is another tool that has consistently shown up in Security Plus exams. Uh, DNSNM to enumerate DNS servers. Wireshark does show up, but not a lot, not a whole lot. Uh, Scapy is another tool that also does appear. Also, I have seen the Cuckoo Sandbox, uh, excuse me, appear as well. All these tools that I am highlighting, uh, again, you have to have the familiarity with. And the good thing is there are plenty of Try Hack Me rooms that will give you the hands-on experience you need to be able to, to get those questions right. So you don't have to be the expert in the tool. You just need to know how to use it. And the best way to do that is by actually doing, by actually playing with the tool, which is why in the work this week, I was much more vague than usual and just said, find four rooms that relate to four different tools or topics that were mentioned in chapter 11 and 12. Again, put, put your hands to the keyboard in Try Hack Me, knock out some rooms, at least four, that relate to things like Scapy, to Wireshark, to Nessus, to Nmap, to the Harvester. Play with those tools in that hands-on environment because that will be quite beneficial when you see those tests. When you, for example, uh, when if you are uh, bold enough to jump over and take this, the so-called final, you will see questions there that relate to tools. So you get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Any questions? Cool. Well, then off to work we go.